Acts chapter 4, verse 32 to 35 is the scripture I'm going to read to open up the word for us today. It says, all the believers were united in heart and mind. And they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything that they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's great blessing was upon them all. Doesn't that sound amazing? What an amazing time in the early church. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring money to the apostles to give to those in need. Lord, I pray you bless your word to us. In Jesus' my name. Can we give God a big shout of praise in the house this morning? He's so good. Oh, it's good to be in the house of God this morning. He's so good. He's so good. He's so good. Praise the Lord. You may take your seats this morning. Just let the person know right beside you as you're taking your seat today. It's time to let it go. Come on, just tell them it's time to let it go. That's a word from the Lord today. Whatever you walked in here with, whatever the battle is, whatever the trial is, whatever the grievance is, whatever the, whatever it is, it's time to let it go. Time to let it go. We're excited this Thursday night will be our first legacy dinner here at the Springs Church. Our legacy dinner is for those who do identify with the gift of generosity to help make the Springs Church uh, accomplish the the vision and the direction that exists within the life of our church. And, and it's open for anybody who wants to come and attend. You can register online. And we uh, celebrated the completion of the building project last week with the certificate of completion that we've been given from the town of Orange Park. And really the next stage of our journey is we really believe that God's leading us into a place where we have to create the f space for the missions that, that, that is in front of us with our food ministry um, with Discover Recovery in particular, we want to raise the funds to be able to fully fund Discover Recovery, uh, a ministry here at our church that helps people who are dealing with hurts, habits, and hang-ups to walk through uh, those battles and those trials. And if you want to, are interested in that, we'd love you to come and be a part of that. And you can sign up online for this Thursday, this Thursday night. And last week, last Sunday morning, as part of this Build Your Church sermon series where we talked about Build Your Church Focus, I really tackled distractions because I think that that's one of the big battles that we're facing right now is distractions. And it was one of the most profound times that I can remember of altar time that in the life of our church where, where people literally came and they took their phones and they surrendered them before the Lord. And it was all these iPhones were all, all there before the Lord and we put them there and we, we surrendered them to the Lord and you guys took them and brought them back with you afterwards of course. But... But, uh, but it was a wonderful moment. I, I, I hope and pray that not only was it an altar moment of surrender, but you put some practical steps behind that to say, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to allow this distraction to be something that chains me or takes me away from being focused on what God has over my life because time is running out, church. Can I put it that way? It's time for the church to be focused. God's given us a mandate. He's given us a mission to go make disciples. He's given us a message. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the only message that sets people free. And so this week we tackled with one pocket last week. I'm going to deal with the other pocket this week. That's our wallet. And I'm not going to ask you to put your wallets at the altar at the end of the, of the service, just so you know that. I'm not going to do that. But it's an important message because, you know, in the Bible it speaks more about finances on that subject than it does about anything else because, because it's such an important factor. It's something that can have such a grip upon our lives that if we don't look at it through a, the lens of Scripture and the Bible and what God has to, how, told us and how we are to view finances... It can be something that limits us and holds us back from, from walking into all that God has for us. And I believe as a church, we'll be defined, me as a pastor, we'll be defined at the end of our days, not by what, what we had at the end, but what we gave away from the beginning. It's about what we give away, not by the square footage that we have, not by the amount that we have in the bank balance, but how much we gave away for the kingdom and how many people we've seen impacted uh, by the gospel of Jesus that we can do in the time frame that, that God gives us. So it's three thoughts I want to give you for those who are, still, who are making notes into uh, the pamphlets this morning, into those Build Your Church um, uh, uh, books that you have. The three points is, number one, generosity is established by grace. Number two, generosity is experienced through love. And number three, generosity is endangered by pride. Let's begin with number one. Generosity is established by grace. Because selfishness is our default. That's our default. We're selfish. And we're getting more selfish as a nation, as a, as a people. 
every single, every single day, every single year, I believe we're getting more and more selfish. We see that with the national debt that continues to rise. Not just national debt, but our own individual credit card debt is an all-time rise. Why? Because we believe that the more that we get, the happier that we'll be. But that's not a biblical principle. We're selfish. We don't like to share anything. And, you know, I, I recognize very early on in marriage when, when my son Sarah made vows that what's, what's hers was mine and what's mine was hers, that there, was, there were some things that I was going to have to be challenged with in my personal life. Because I began to realize that when my son Sarah would go out to restaurants that her favorite food was share. That was her favorite food was share. She's like, I don't mind where we eat. Just, well, I'll just share what you're having. Listen, listen, I love the Lord, and God's done a deep work in my life, but my Chick-fil-A waffle fries are my Chick-fil-A waffle fries. <laughs> Nobody touches my Chick-fil-A waffle fries. When I get it, whether it's large or me, they're mine. When I go to Lenopolera, and I love a bit of Lenopolera, when I go to Lenopolera and I get that California burrito, let me tell you, I don't order that California burrito believing that I won't consume every piece of that, that, that mega monster burrito. I will eat that. Every pepper, every piece of chicken, I will lick that, that cheese off of that plate because that, that is mine, says the Lord. So I, when it, <laughs> but, but early on, we had, to re, we had to work that one out because they were like, well, I'll just share a little bit of yours. And I was like, no, no, we we're going to work this one. Why? Because, because I'm selfish. We're selfish by default. We are. And we're living in a consumer-driven society where the whole economy is built off of you consuming and you spending money and you going out there and being unsatisfied with what you already have and this craving and this need for more and more and more. See, this world would tell you that you're more blessed to get than you are to, to give. The world will tell you that you're more blessed to get than you are to give. But I want to tell you that's a lie from the enemy. It's a lie from the pit of hell. Because let's think about this word blessed for a moment. This word blessed literally means happy. Like the more happy you are is the more that you get rather than when you give. But I want to tell you that the feelings you get when you get a new iPhone or a brand new car are fleeting feeling. But the emotion, the feeling, the happiness and the joy that you get in being a part of the kingdom of God, a part of the work of God, and a part of the economy of God is something that, that doesn't rot with this world. It doesn't rot with the things of this world. It is something that lasts beyond us. And there's something of a greater joy that comes from it. That's why Acts chapter 20 verse 35 says, It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. See, what was happening in the early church was counterculture. Because they were sharing everything with one another. There was nobody who had needs because they seen needs represented. And they sold what they had so that they could bless their brothers and sisters and make sure that nobody was without. Now, some people look at Acts chapter 4 and believe it's an argument for communism. But let me tell you, it's not an argument for communism. Because it's not motivated by law or policy. It's not about how much taxation you add on or what the government does. This type of generosity can be something that's only motivated by love. And that love, it doesn't come from your favorite country and western song. That love comes from the gospel of Jesus. Generosity is established by grace because you have been given generously from a generous God. You have been given amazing grace. God has not held back from you. He has lavished his love upon you. How many of you know that you're blessed today, that God has blessed you today? That's why it says in verse 33, and God's great blessing was upon, upon all of them. Romans chapter 8, verse 32, Paul said, Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? That's what the word says. Or 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9 says, You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. See, we won't be defined by what we get. We'll be defined by what we give away. And too much of our culture tells us we got to climb the ladder of success, which I believe we got to be saying, God, if you've blessed me, you've blessed me for a purpose. You've blessed me for a reason. You've blessed me to help those who, uh, who are in a position that I can help and I can support. That's why even with Hurricane Helene or Hurricane Milton, we watched the church respond. We were watching a young Christian couple who had, 
who had done well in business and had their own private helicopter. And the minute Hurricane, Helicane, Hurricane Helene happened, they began to use that helicopter to go in and rescue families that were caught in places that nobody else could go into. The church began to respond. Not because government mandated them to use that helicopter, but because they had experienced the generous grace of God. There was something in the disposition of their heart that said, we must respond to this. We must respond in this situation. Because generosity is rooted in the gospel of Jesus, a God who loved us so much that he gave. Listen closely. Generosity, generosity is not about what I do. It's about who I am. It's a heart issue. And only the gospel can take a heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh. Now some of you guys may be going, man, did I have to show up to church today? This message today? Well, let me tell you, I believe this is an important message. I remember when I had um, a ligament damage in my knee from sports and I went to the doctor. And the doctor put me up on a table and he began to, he began to, take that, that my leg and he began to bend it and he began to twist it and he began to prod at it and he began to find out where the pain places were. Every time there was pain, he would twist it a little bit more. Or he would, but he, he'd put a, push some pressure on it a little bit more. And I was, like, I was like, this is painful. And he was like, it's in that place of pain that he realizes where the, the, the need for, for a, a surgery or where the need for a recovery is going to take place. And some of us, sometimes we need to know that sometimes the gospel does step on our toes a little bit. But that's exactly what the gospel is supposed to do. It's supposed to find those areas. And when you go through that, that place of, of healing and recovery, sometimes when you're going through that physical ter therapy on the other side, that can be painful as well. But it's bringing you to a place where you can walk in your own strength, where you can walk through it. And that's, that's, what, that's what the Bible does when it comes to this area of finances now, yeah, it might be painful. There might be pain in the offering. But can I tell you that God had to do this in me before I could ever stand here in a pulpit and ever share about it. I remember as a young teenager, 15, 16 years of age, and as a, our youth ministry was talking about tithing and talking about the importance of learning what it is to give your first tent over to the Lord. I thought, this is the most ridiculous idea ever. Whoever would come up with such an idea as this, of giving over my... My $2 out of $20 that I get every week from my mom and dad. Like, this is, this, is, this is crazy. But I do believe that God had to deal with my heart early in life where I began to trust that generosity is not about a number. Generosity is about a heart, a heart issue. That I can trust God with, with what I've got. See, generosity is established in the gospel. But number two, generosity is experienced through love. The apostles were boldly proclaiming the gospel through preaching but the church was displaying the gospel with generosity. It was what was counterculture. It was why there was such a vast amount of people that were coming and believing and putting their faith in Jesus. It's not only were they watching the proclamation of the gospel, but they were watching the gospel being painted by the early church, displaying the love of God through their generosity with one another. And if we don't get this right in finances, we won't be painting a picture of the gospel. We will be blocking the view on the generosity of God because we will make this about something that it was never supposed to be about. See, there's no, we don't preach a prosperity gospel. That is, that is a lie from the pit of hell where you say, if you give $10, uh, then you'll get $100. That's something you're mandating. When we think about generosity from a biblical perspective, the motivation of it is not a law that we find in the Old Testament. It's a motivation that when we understand how much we're loved, how much God has given us, how, much, how generous that God has been to us, we can't help but respond in generosity. See, let me... Let me talk to you a little bit about, about, about tithing and why we talk about tithing and why that's a part of our announcements every single week. Tithing is a biblical principle where we give one-tenth of our income to the Lord. It originated in the Old Testament before even the law was given with Moses where Abraham gave a tenth of, it, of, of, of what he had to the priest Melchizedek. But then was later formalized in law through the Mosaic law and uh, the Israelite worship, there was tithes and there was offerings that came out. And it's a principle that I believe is a principle that's carried right through the Old and the New, New Testament that we still practice today where we put God first in our finances. See, God didn't make a mistake when he created the Sabbath. 
When he made the Sabbath, he set a day aside, the beginning of the week, that we would rest and trust in him. When we get to the beginning of a new year, we take some time to fast and to pray, to put aside the temporary things that satisfy our flesh, to put our trust in the eternal work and nature of God in our time of prayer and fasting. In every area of our lives, we don't believe that God deserves our leftovers, but God deserves our very best. See, it's more than just words. It's, it's actions with our lives as well. It's, it's trust. So here are five things that are important, I believe, lessons that we need to know about tithing from the scriptures. One, tithing puts God first and everything else second. Tithing puts God first and everything else second. I know I'm not going to get a lot of amens this morning. I understand that. I got you. I got it. I got it. It's the, it's the, it's the pain spot. But C.S. Lewis said like this, but put first things first and you get second things thrown in. You put second things first and you lose both first and second things. See, trust is the foundation of any relationship. But I want to ask you, do you trust God with your finances? Do you trust God in this area that, that, that I'm going to trust God with what he says more than what I see? Because, listen, I'm in the same situation as, as many of you out there with a young family where we're watching inflation continue to rise up. We're seeing insurance costs continue to skyrocket. We're seeing the cost of goods and services continue to skyrocket. And a challenge and a difficulty it is to come through on all of the various things that are there inside in our lives. And, but when we come to our budget and we say, hey, before we do anything else, we're going to put God first. We're saying, I trust you, God, more with what you say in your word than what I see in my eyes. And every time that we do that, we begin to see God begin to do something special through what God has already given us. See, tithing breaks, number two, the cycle of fear and lack. That I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. Tim Delina, pastor of Times Square Church in New York City, said it like this. God can do more with the 90% than I can do with 100%. It's an act of faith, you see. To say, God, see, when we, when we hold on, we say, okay, I'm, I'm a better steward of what, I, of what God has given me than God himself who's given me everything. What's your starting point? Is God the owner of the cattle of the thousand hills? Does God own everything or do we own everything? we got to be so careful, church. Because as Christians, we can be begin to think that the whole world resolve, revolves around us because God loves us. But let me tell you, the whole world doesn't revolve around you. The whole world revolves around the goodness and the kindness and the grace of the mercy of Jesus. And he owns everything. And what happens is when you begin to give God your first fruits, let me tell you, there's a, a breaking of the cycle of fear and lack that, we, that there will not be enough at the end. But when I put God first, it puts everything else into order afterwards. It makes me realize that when we are, when we are going through a struggle, that we can look through a budget and say, maybe I don't need five cups of coffee every week for my favorite coffee spot. But I'm not going to cheat on God. I'm not going to take away from what God's told me to do. I'm going to say, God, you deserve my first fruits in my life. Number three, tithing loosens the grip of temporary stuff. It breaks the hold of possessions. Stuff become less important to us. Greg Rochelle puts it like this, more money does not make you more generous. More money makes you more of who you are. See, I think sometimes the lie of the enemy is, you got to wait until you get more money, and then you can learn to be generous. But can I tell you, no matter if you're on Wall Street, no matter if, you, if you're in a, a, a movie star or a singer, whatever it is, if money controls you, more money will not make you more generous. You know, I was watching a headline, I'm going to divulge it, of a, a famous singer in our society who she gave millions of dollars to, to aid to, to the hurricane relief as if it was some sort of thing. I was like... I bet that has not got a, 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 a it can't, cannot, that cannot compare to the church of Jesus Christ that's stepping up left, right, and center and giving millions upon millions upon millions of dollars. Not only just putting money there, but putting lives out there and volunteers out there and getting out there because more money does not make you more generous. More money makes you more of who you already are. Number four, tithing shows contentment in what God has already supplied. I'm already content in what God has. I don't need more, more to be happy. I'm already blessed in Jesus Christ. He's already supplied everything that I need for my life, and God is. I can be content. God leads us with contentment is great gain. I'm going to be content in the God who loves me and cares for me. And finally, number five is tithing unlocks God's blessings. Giving, listen closely, giving 
according to scripture, is blessed by God. And this is where there's a shift from an Old Testament principle, an Old Testament principle of tithing, given the first tent, to a New Testament principle of generosity. Where God, everything that I have, I'm going to give to you. It reminds me of the old story of John Wesley, the great revivalist who was the, was the founding father of the Methodist movement. And one day when he was in his office, he, was, he had bought pictures for his new office that he was moving into. And he was hanging the pictures on the wall. And, and somebody came to the office door who didn't have enough money for a coat. And he reached into his pockets to take out money for that coat and realized that he'd spent all of his money on these new pictures that he was putting inside his office. And God convicted him in that moment in time. That's not to say that we go out and we sell all of our photos on our walls or all of our pictures on our walls or the possessions that we have. But see, genera generosity is not an action, it's an attitude. And something happened in his life that says, I'm going to live generously from this point onwards in my life. It was said in today's modern uh, uh, money that he earned about $160,000 a year per annum. But he made a decision that he was going to live on $20,000 a year and give $140,000 to the work of God every single year. See, that's what an example of generosity is. I remember one of the founding fathers of the church, the Evangelical Church in Ireland, told me a story one time about when he moved from England over uh, to, to Ireland to uh, evangelize and to bring uh, the gospel to, to the nation. And he's there... In, for about one year, it was one year before he seen one person come to know Jesus as a savior. And there was hardly any income that was coming in. He had a young family, young children. And he said as they were getting ready to come into winter, they had no coal to, 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 to light a fire in their, in their house to keep, keep everybody warm during the winter. And he would literally have his wife and children asking him, where, where are we going to get the heat from? Where are we going to get the coal from him? And all he could say is, I just know God's going to provide. I know that God's going to provide. I'm, we're just going to trust the Lord. God's coal is here. Then God's going to make a way for us as well. And one day as the coal was creeping in and they didn't know where the where it was going to come from or how they were going to put heat in their house, there was a knock on the door. And there was a coal truck that was traveling down the road and it hit at the side of the road when it, led, and it, had, it had, had knocked over and all the coal had fallen out all over the ground in front. And the driver said, I need to help clean this up. You can have as much of this coal as you want, but I need to get this coal off of this ground as fast as I can. He said, we had so much coal that winter, we were giving coal out to the neighbors that year. Can I just tell you, God is a provider this morning. Can I tell you, you can trust God, that God is a provider even when we feel. See, in the light of the new covenant, we recognize we're already blessed this morning. Tiding unlocks God's blessings because we're already blessed. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 to 10 says this. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good, good wine. Or Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 to 12. Listen closely to this church. This is the word of the Lord. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of our heaven's armies, I will open up the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Listen closely. Try it. God says, put me to the test. This is one of the only places you'll find this in the scripture. God says, put me to the test in this area of tithe. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such delights as the Lord of heaven's armies. See, this is so counterculture, isn't it? We don't want to test the Lord in this area. We want to hold on to what we already have. But the Bible says, never have I seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging for bread. This Bible is a whole journey to remind us that God is a faithful God who never leaves us or he never forsakes us. Amen. See, there may be somebody in this room and God's not called you just to sit in this chair. He's called you to the mission field. Amen. And you may need to learn here in this chair that you need to learn to trust God with what you got right now before you're on the mission field. And you don't know where the next pro provision is going to come from. But you just got to trust in Lord that God is going to provide. You're holding on to something. The great missionary Hudson Taylor who went to inland China. He was studying to become a doctor so that he would have access to China to bring his medical uh, uh, knowledge over there. And he was the first missionary into inland China to bring the gospel in there, Hudson Taylor. And while he was practicing medicine in England, God began to convict him that before he went to China, he had to learn generosity to his own community. 
So after his studies, he would go into the local neighborhoods that were low income and he would start to give what he had and make meals and bring them to people who were less fortunate. And one night he was on the way home and he had one shilling that was left in his pocket on the way home. And he, he knew that that shilling was, was just about enough to get him through the next day, maybe not even enough. But as he was going home, there was a beggar on the street that was asked him, do you just have a shilling? Do you just have a shilling? And he said, he justified in his mind, no, this belongs to me. I'll, this is mine for, my, for me to get through to tomorrow. And he walked on by, past him, and God convicted him in that moment in time. And he would later record that if, if he did not surrender that there, how could God ever use him in inland China? So he took that shilling and he went back and he gave it to that person that day. The next day he went home and there was an envelope that was left for him with, with four times the amount that he had given to that person that next day. Now that's amazing, praise the Lord. But that does nothing compared to when he was on the mission field. And he was, he was thousands and thousands of miles from local commerce and people that were, were looking out for him and helping him out. And he's in inland China all by himself. And he gets to a place where he literally has nothing left. So much so that he gets to the side of a street and he lies down and he's, he's, ha he's just going to go to sleep. And he's not sure if he's going to wake up or not because he's so hungry and he's got nothing left to help him on this mission that he knows that God has led him to this place. He knows that God has called him to a missionary to this place. But he just lies down and says, God, I'm going to be content even if you give me nothing more. He said the next morning he woke up and there was a courier who had brought a parcel that came all the way from England that came with a, with a, with a donation that somebody, now this is, not, this is before FedEx, this is before UPS, this is before Bitcoin or Cash App or anything else to try and get that. This is, this is somebody that six to nine months earlier, God put it on their heart to give some finances to a work that he knew nothing about, just that there was a missionary called Hudson Taylor in inland China, gave that donation over. And here is him now in inland China, and a courier, he doesn't even have a house address. He doesn't even have a, a zip code. He doesn't have GPS. He doesn't have Google Maps. Yet this courier finds him miles and miles inland and gives him the provision. Why? Because if you stand and you say, I'm going to trust you, God, with my life, with everything. Oh, can I tell you? Come on, somebody. God is a provider. He is the owner of the cattle of South Hills. And he is the God who provides. Church, we've got to paint the picture of the gospel through the generosity. But that generosity only comes from God doing the work in our hearts. Because it's a heart issue. Jeremiah said the heart is deceitful. Above all things, who can know it? See, generosity is not an action. It's a disposition of our heart. Is your heart generous? Generous? You trust the Lord. Let me draw this into a close. Because there's two examples that the Bible sets up in Acts in this build your church moment of the early church. One is in Acts chapter 4 verse 36. Where you see Barnabas, who was a son of encouragement. Who was a Levi and he had a piece of land in Cyprus and he sold that field and he laid it at the feet of the apostles. But then you go over one chapter later... Acts chapter 5, verse 1 and 11, and you're introduced to the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And we don't like that story. We don't. Because the story of Ananias and Sapphira is that they sold a piece of land, but they conspired within each other to say that they were giving the full amount, but they kept a portion back to themselves. Now look what it says in verse 3 of chapter 5. Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or to not sell. In other words, God's not mandating that we sell all of our property and lay it at the apostles' feet. He said, the property was yours to sell or not to sell as you wish. And after selling it, the money was yours to give away. How could you do this thing? You weren't lying to us, but you were lying to God. Verse 5, as soon as Ananias heard his words, he fell to the floor and he died. Ooh. I'm not going to call an altar call right now. But I believe God was setting a mark right down in the early church. Because it was not, see, what had happened, let me, Ananias and Sapphira were people who were part of the fellowship. They were known amongst the community. This is what I believe happened. A little bit maybe of conjecture in this moment in time. I believe Ananias and Sapphira seen Barnabas. 
go and sell that field and bring the whole proceeds because that was the generosity that God put upon Barnabas's mind and heart to lay that at the apostles' feet. And I can imagine that there was a, there was a sense of awe or wonder at the, the, the magnitude, the extravagant generosity that, that Barnabas had done by taking this gift and putting it at the disciples' feet. And maybe something in Ananias and Sapphira that got into their heart that they wanted to have the same rep reputation, the same reputation as as Barnabas. See, every gift that's given is not done motivated by love. Some, this is where, see, this is the last point right here, church. This is the last point right here. Is that generosity is endangered by pride. That's why we got to get this right in the church. When it comes to finances, we've got to get this one right. Because sometimes if we're not careful by our own pride, we can look like we're doing something in order to gain the reputation of others or to make ourselves look good or make ourselves that our name is lifted up. And I believe that Ananias and Sapphira at this point in time, that they were more interested in their reputation. That's why the Bible speaks so much about money because it can have such a controlling effect on our lives. Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 21, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths, rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Where's your treasure at this morning, church? In Matthew 6, 24, a few verses, verses later, Jesus would say, no one can serve two masters. No one can serve two masters. For you will either hate one and you will love the other. You will be devoted to one, and you'll despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Something has to give. See, this was an attack not from outside of the church, on the church. This was an attack from inside the church. But God was, this attack was going to fall flat on his face because when attack, when Satan comes against his church from the inside, God always sets up a standard against the enemy. He's not going to allow that attack to have its way. we got to be careful. What is the motivation of the generosity that God has put on us? Because Ananias means gracious, but he found out that God was holy too. Sapphira means beautiful, but could not hide her ugly motivation. There was an energization of this that had come and just, Satan had brought this about. See, the love of money is something we got to be so careful about where is that motivation coming from because if we're not careful that generosity would be endangered by pride and hypocrisy saying we're doing one thing but doing something completely different my prayer is God help us protect us as a church that we never take our focus off of the gospel of Jesus Christ see I don't have to convince you to give I can't convince you to give I can implore you to give God your heart because if you give God your heart, then everything else flows out of that. Just let God have your heart. Just let God have your heart. Then, it'll, then you'll realize that these things of these worlds, they don't matter. That I can give this stuff away because it matters. So let, let me tell you, as I've been pastor here at this church over the past three years, there's been moments and times and challenges. As we've gone through this building project where there's been temptations and times to hold back and some of the giving and some of the generosity that we have We've done as part of church because we look at what we see. We look at the bills. We look at the project. We look at the challenges that's ahead. But I just want to say, three years later, I have no idea how everything got accomplished, how all the missions have taken place, how all of the different works has taken place. But I know this, that my God is a provider. I know my God is a provider. How many of you know today that God is a provider? If you know he's a provider, just give him praise upon this, in this place today. No moving around this place today. No moving around this place today. I'm just going to draw this to close. We called this one Build Your Church Full, but I think we gave it the wrong name. Really the name should be Build Your Church Empty. That God, I don't want to try and accumulate. God, I want to try and give away as much as I can in my lifetime. God, help me. Give me the heart of John, John Wesley, God. To not limit you even to 10, Lord God, but God, that my whole life might be poured out like an offering, God. In whatever way, shape, or form that you have. See, when we dealt with one pocket last week with the phone, I believe it's a representation of, of an ability to be addicted to something. Chains that need to be broken. And let me tell you, God wants to break chains. God can break chains. 
God has broken chains. God will continue to break chains in this house. God will do miracles. God will heal the sick. God will do the, make the impossible and will turn it possible. God will do miracles in this house. He'll break chains. But I believe when it comes to finances, there's something a little bit different. There was this old, old experiment that you may have heard of before where they took a monkey and they, they put a jar out where they put a cookie into the jar. And the monkey, when he would put his hand in the jar, he'd be able to grab that cookie. But when he would pull his arm out, he wouldn't be able to get his arm back out again. And he would get stuck there. And they would leave him there to see if he would figure it out that all he had to do was let go and he'd be able to move on. See, I think finance is oftentimes, it's not about a chain that needs to be broken, but something that we just need to let go of. That we're not held back by the things of this world, the pleasures of this world, the scarcity of this world. But I'm going to tr trust in the supply of God more than the scarcity that this world has to offer. That I'm not going to be held back by looking at all that God wants to do in my life, God wants to do through my life. That God wants to uh, uh, demonstrate His love and His grace and ex exemplify His work through my life. But I'm just stuck with my hand holding on to the system of this world, trying to live from one week to the next week. Now let me not get it twisted. I know there's challenges. I know there's battles. I believe there's a potential for financial freedom in this house. We'll do courses every so often on financial freedom because God's, God's not just given us a spirit. He's also given us a mind as well. Oh, he's given us a sound mind as well. Can I tell you, you don't become generous by accident. Generosity is something that happens by intentional decisions. Generosity happens when you learn how to do a budget properly. When you say, I'm going to put first things first. I don't, you don't get fit and healthy by just, by just showing up to McDonald's every day and hoping, maybe I'm going to get fit and healthy one day. No, there's an intentional decisions that take place along the way that leads us there. You know, God's given you a sound mind, church. He's given you intelligence. He's given you knowledge, there's resources, there's wisdom. And he's given you the Holy Spirit as well. Oh, we're so blessed. We're so blessed. My cup run it over. See, this morning what we're doing is we're changing our mindset, our attitude. From a place of scarcity that I don't have enough. To God, you've been so good to me. God, I lack nothing. God, you've been my provider. God, you've been my protector. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what storm is coming. I don't know what challenge is coming. I don't know what's on the other side of this election. I don't know what's coming. But one thing I know, God, you never change. You're the same yesterday. You're the same today. And you're the same forevermore. Come on, church. Can we give God praise across this place today? He's the same. Hallelujah. 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 Let's stand to our feet across this place. Can we just sing that? course across this place we'll see miracles because I believe that. I believe we will see miracles. I believe we will see God move in a mighty way in the way that only He can. Let's just focus in on the Lord for a moment. Maybe you're here today and God has challenged your heart to let go of some things in your life, to let go of holding on to some patterns. Maybe for the first time in your life that maybe something that God would do is, is bring you to a place where you trust God with your, with your tithe. Maybe that's a place where God would bring you to a place in your life and say, God, Lord, in every area of my life, Lord, you have my trust, Lord, and confidence, Lord, that you're able. God, we will see miracles, God. We will see giants fall. We will see you come through for your people, Lord. Never, ever, ever have we seen the righteous forsaken. Never, ever have we seen the seed begging for bread. Thank you, Jesus. Worship team leaders. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.